Thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to chat with you guys and present some facts and ideas on this. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to run out shortly after, after my presentation. I will be available for some brief Q&A. But, uh, but please, if you have some, some questions or things that you would like to discuss with me, please feel free to contact me via email. You can find me via, via Google very easily, or, or Sally it's or the, the staff packet. can provide you with, with contact information. OK. So here's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot to cover, as Sally said. So I'm going to move pretty quickly. Uh, it is going to be a, a fairly high-level view, uh, although it is about, uh, about stuff that matters. It's not purely, purely academic. One of my colleagues likes to say that, as academics, we operate where the rubber meets the sky. Uh, but, but this is hopefully going to be, although high-level, really, uh, about rubber meeting the road. So I want to talk about some basic facts about U.S. healthcare spending, put it in context, talk about issues, drivers, policy approaches, and the organization of the talk are the four W's. What, who cares, why, and what can we do about it? So let's start with, with what. As you undoubtedly know, we spend a lot of money on, uh, on healthcare, $2.9 trillion in 2013, give or take a billion or two. Um, I'll, I'll take, the, uh, take the rounding error if nobody else wants it. That's uh, over 17% of our national income, gross domestic product. And, not, there's an, and what you have here on the slide are just a number of different ways to look at it. If you have $6 in your wallet and you take them out and you set one off to the side, that's what goes to health care in the overall economy. Or another way to imagine it is if you were a worker getting paid $12 an hour and, uh, and you took, off, took $2 off the top of that and you ended up with 10, that's another way to think about how much is going to, to health care. The health care sector alone, if you, took, if you imagined that our health care sector was a, a geographically distinct entity, like there was an island somewhere that was U.S. health care sector. That would be the fifth largest economy on the planet. Uh, the U.S. health care sector is bigger than the entire economy of France. Uh, uh, may, the French may not be too happy to hear that. Now, of course, uh, the U.S. healthcare sector produces things like colonoscopies and knee replacements, and the French economy produces things like fine wines and gourmet cheeses and French bread, but they're both valuable. And then, in any event, guess, just, to, just to give some perspective on this, if we took hospital care alone, that's almost 6% of the entire economy spending on hospital care. Docs, uh, about 3.5%. And insurance, that's sort of the, the cost of insurance net of medical expenses, about 1% of national income. And in a minute, I'll compare this to some other sectors of the economy to try and give you some perspective on this. OK, so that's the level. Now, what, what, what the real concern is, real, is not so much the level of spending. And I'll, I'll talk about why that's the case a little bit later. But it's, it's the rate of growth. And, <laughs> The uh, health care spending has been high and, and growing very rapidly until quite recently. From about 2009 onward, health care spending has continued to grow, but it's grown much more slowly. In particular, it has not grown uh, much faster than the rate of growth of the overall economy. So that's a, that's a, a marked change. But it's important to realize it's not that it stopped growing. It is still growing. It's just the rate of growth is lower than it than it previously was. Now, even uh, given that, healthcare spending is predicted to rise substantially over the next uh, 20 years or so. And uh, that will take up a larger share of the economy, and in particular, also a larger share of the federal budget. Now, all forecasts are wrong. That's just, that's just their nature. So it's not to say that this will happen. But the, the current forecasts are that we will see more of this. And of course, I'll talk about this again in a, in a few minutes. If we don't know whether the current slower rate of growth of health spending will continue 
or not. If it accelerates again, that could change the picture. If it continues to grow more slowly or even slows further, then obviously the picture moves in the opposite direction. But it, but it is a big deal. All right, here's a graph that shows you this. If you look at the far right of the graph, uh, you can see that health spending as a percent of GDP has been about pretty flat since about 2009. Uh, one thing to notice is this isn't the first time this has happened. If you look at the 90s, about the midpoint of that graph, you see something similar happening around that time. And even sort of the mid-2000s, it's not exactly flat, but it's slowed down. So while the slower rate of growth is, is a, a change, it's something that's not unique. This sort of thing has happened before. It's not a new problem. This is a drawing by Andy Warhol. Uh, this is actual real, real drawing. Uh, who, uh, is anybody here from Pennsylvania or southwestern Pennsylvania? OK, well, uh, well anyway, uh, I'll, I'll brag anyhow. A Andy actually went to Carnegie Mellon University, was then Carnegie Institute of Technology, graduated in 1949. He's a Pittsburgh native, some of you may know this. And uh, this was done about 1985 or 86. Actually, the Christie's Auction House was uh, selling this off a couple years ago. I tried to persuade my wife that we should bid on this. And uh, for some reason, I don't quite understand. She wasn't terribly enthusiastic, even though it seemed to me it would be a wonderful investment. Anyhow, uh, it's, it's out there. It's out there somewhere. Uh, in, in terms of how big a part of the U.S. economy health care is, here are some numbers for comparison. I'm not going to walk you through all of these, but say, uh, what's a very important uh, market or industry in the U.S. economy. Let's say computer and electronic products, right? We'd all agree with that. Well, that's less than 2% of national income. What about broadcasting and telecom? That's a little over 3%. Motor vehicles, a little bit over 1%. What's really important, the brewing industry, right? at least uh, according to my, uh, my college age and uh, recently post-college age sons, um, less than 1%, right? about 15 hundredths of 1%, in spite of the fact that all the college students in the US are doing their level best to increase, uh, increase the share of the brewing industry as part of GDP, it's still, it's still very small. In terms of government expenditures, typically uh, the big three for the US government, and you probably know this, are health care, uh, Social Security, and national defense. Education is up there. And which of them is number one actually varies from year to year. But in 2013, health was, uh, was the largest, and actually by, by a reasonably wide margin. If we compare the U.S. to other countries, uh, these are data that come from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. You can see that the U.S. is, is way out there. We spend a lot more than, than anybody else. Uh, the Netherlands, France, and Germany spend a lot. You can see even if you go to the U.K., which is right next to the, the red uh, vertical bar, uh, just slightly larger than the overall average for the OECD, the UK spends more than 9% of its national income on health care, which is a lot, but it's substantially less than, than the United States. So uh, large, wealthy countries do spend large chunks of their national income on health care. That's not surprising, but the US does spend quite a bit more. And I'm not saying good, bad, or indifferent. This is just a fact. If we look at international growth in health spending, I actually want to direct your attention to the, to the panel that has the US on it. You can see the, the label, the big US in black. And that's looking at, at rate of growth of, of uh, spending from 2000 up to 2011. Uh, the, that part of the chart for the US should, US should look familiar. You just saw that. But it also has Canada, Germany, France, and Japan on there. And one thing that's notable is that these look very similar. In particular, you see the flattening out in recent years is happening not just in the US, but in these other countries as well. So something is happening in those places that is flattening out the rate of growth of healthcare spending at the same time as it's happening in the United States. And you can see the red line is the OECD average. Even that, which includes lots of countries that are really not very similar to us, has, that, has a very similar pattern as well. So we'll hold on to that and we'll come back to it. I'm not going to talk about what's happening to the rate of growth of health care spending in Estonia. You can look at the slides if you're deeply, not that 
I have nothing against Estonia. It's a, it's a lovely place, I have no doubt. Uh, but if you're deeply interested, you can come back to that. Uh, where does the money come from? So you can see uh, the private stuff, private out of pocket, private health insurance, a little bit, uh, a little bit less than, than half. Other third party stuff, if you add that, that's a little more than half. Medicare, Medicaid, and other public stuff. It's it's roughly it's roughly 50/50. Um, now what's been happening over time is that the proportion public has been increasing and proportion private. Has been has been decreasing. Uh, we very likely will will continue that shift, and I'll I'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay, uh, here are some figures on annual growth on average in spending per enrollee from 2009 to 2013. Although actually the Medicaid bar, which is the red one, only goes up to 2011. For some reason, I I I just didn't find. Uh, the, the two most recent years of data on that in, in time to, to produce the slides, but I don't think it tells you uh, a very different picture. So what you can see is, uh, is sort of relatively slow growth, uh, but in particular for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, the rates of growth have been remarkably slow, and you're going to hear a lot more detail about, about Medicare uh, later on, so I'm not going to really try and try and di dissect that. And just for comparison, you can see the gray bar is the rate of growth for GDP per capita over this period, and the blue, the light blue bar, whatever that color is, um, is the is is roughly the rate of inflation over this over this period. So GDP has been growing faster than inflation, and somewhat remarkably faster than the rate of growth in both Medicare and Medicaid spending per at least per this is per enrollee. All right, just breaking this out a little bit, um, this is just uh, information year by year for folks with private employer-sponsored health insurance. And uh, you can see the, the vertical bars tell you the spending per enrollee in private health insurance, and the red line shows your rate of growth. So you can see, again, after 2009, this, this drop in the rate of growth, and then it bounces around a little bit after that, but stays pretty constant, 3.7, 3.84 in that range. Here's Medicare, and you can see actually that it's dropping, uh, not steadily, but, but dropping dramatically from 2008 onwards, even uh, slightly negative growth in 2012, uh, 2013. Again, this is per enrollee, very, very low rates of growth. So this is really, really remarkable. And here's Medicaid. Like I said, this only goes through 2011, but the basic trend continues again. Um, really a pretty steep dive in the rate of growth of spending per enrollee for, for Medicaid over this period as well. What about health insurance coverage? Uh, uh, not surprisingly, based on what I told you about spending, uh, employer-sponsored insurance has been shrinking. Publicly, uh, a publicly funded insurance like Medicare and Medicaid have been growing. Obviously, the Affordable Care Act uh, has an impact on this picture. Um, it, it's going to have impacts on both private and, and public. Medicaid expansion, of course, is a large part of the Affordable Care Act. And uh, then people getting private insurance in the exchanges, some of that's publicly financed. The subsidies, obviously, are publicly financed. But some of that is coming out of, out of people's own pockets. And in particular, uh, the, the, um, the percent uninsured is not, is not up to date. That has dropped quite, quite a bit over the past few, few years. Uh, due, to the, uh, due to the Affordable Care Act. So we have fewer people in the uninsured part of the pie. Some of those are getting insurance through the public, uh, the public uh, system, uh, the publicly financed system. A lot of that's Medicaid. Some of that through the exchanges will be partially publicly financed, partially privately financed. OK, so those are some ba very basic facts about health care. What you have to ask yourself, though, is so what? Who cares? All right, we spend $3 trillion on health care. That's a lot of money, right? But we're a rich country, on average. We're a very rich country. Uh, we have to spend the money on something. Well, we could save it, but we're Americans. We don't save money, right? Um, the savings rate here is, is essentially, essentially zero. Uh, I mean, it's not 100% fair if you count uh, real estate. Uh, as, as savings, and that's not, not completely accurate. But, but anyhow, uh, we got a lot of money. Uh, you can buy 
another refrigerator. I have two refrigerators. I'm not quite sure why, but I do. Um, I have two cars. I don't know what I would do with another car. Look, Tom Brady got um, a, a truck for being MVP in the Super Bowl, and he, he gave it away to, uh, to the guy who made the interception. Good thing, but you know he probably couldn't fit the truck between the Maserati and the Bentley. I mean, how many cars can Tom handle? I'm not taking anything away from his gesture. It was a very noble, noble gesture. But at some point, you know, we're going to spend the money on something. And healthcare is a very sensible thing to spend more money on. Why? What's well, been getting more valuable? If you look at, I don't have these here, but say if you go to um, National Center for Health Statistics, they put out a report every year called Health United States. What's been happening in life expectancy in the United States? It's been going up. Infant mortality has been going down. Uh, mortality from heart disease has been going down. Uh, we can treat all kinds of problems now that either we couldn't treat or we can treat them far more effectively. Serious mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder can be treated much more effectively through medications that didn't exist a relatively short time ago. We're much better at treating heart disease now than we were 20 or 30 years ago. If your knee goes bad, right, and it's totally non-functional, you go in, they chop your knee out, right, they get a you know, circular saw, cut it off, get an artificial joint, get some super glue, stick it in there, and you walk out. You're not going to play in the NBA, okay? But you can walk, uh, running, eh, maybe, uh, but you can function. If your hip goes bad, same thing. Uh, all of us develop cataracts in the lenses of our eyes over time. It's just a question of how big they get and how fast, fast they grow. But it's a very common problem. And if you get cataracts interfere with your vision, that they, you can get that treated in about 15 minutes by a skilled ophthalmologist. They apply a topical anesthetic to your eyeball. It used to be they took a needle and stuck it into your eyeball. <laughs> Sorry, Sally. They don't do that anymore. They just, they just rub on a topical anesthetic, make a very small incision, stick a little sort of thing in there that vibrates and breaks up the cataract, aspirates it, kind of like a little rotor rooter thing. And then they take a flexible lens, stick it in there, and you're done. And your vision can actually be better than it was before. So this is really pretty remarkable. Um, and there's all, all, you know, all kinds of pharmaceuticals have been developed that, that really have major, major impacts on health. So, so I, and I can't emphasize that, that too much. Another perspective is, look, uh, there's lots of things that we spend lots of money on. Think of how much money you spend on telecom, your cable, your, your voice, uh, data bill, right? We spend lots of money on that, a lot more than we did a few years ago. But I'm not standing here talking to you about the problem of increased spending on IT and telecom. The president uh, isn't making speeches about this. Your bosses are, I don't think, probably worrying about this. Why? Well, it's clear this stuff has, has become more valuable, so it's totally rational to spend more money on it. But, but here's the but. It's nonetheless a problem for, uh, for the US. Even though healthcare is very valuable on average, at the margin, we're, we're certainly spending too much money on healthcare. What that means is that it's crowding out spending or investment on more valuable goods or services. Another way to put it is if we spent a dollar less, I mean a dollar, a hundred million, whatever, a billion less on healthcare and spend it on other on, on other stuff, maybe not just not just anything, uh, not Hello Kitty dolls, probably, but on education infrastructure what have you, that we'd be better off taking that money and, uh, and using those resources elsewhere. And there, uh, there are some ways to illustrate that. So let me, let me go, go into that. Uh, if, if you look at, uh, at what would have happened to a, a typical family of four over the period 1999 to 2009, uh, increased health care spending basically would have eaten up all or almost all of increases in income for a typical family four over, over that period. And this gives you some details with, with the numbers. I'm not going to, going to go, go into that. Now, it's not crazy to think that they would be spending more of their budget on health care over this time period. But to have all of it go to health care does seem that it's almost certainly excessive. So that's one way to, to I think, put, put, um, 
put some life into this. Now, of course, healthcare spending has been growing uh, more slowly since 2009. So if we extended this forward to 2013, it wouldn't be as dramatic, right? But it still would be a big deal. And of course, if the rate of growth picks up in the future, then we'll be looking at the same thing. Here's another way to look at it. If you compare health insurance premiums, what workers contribute to those premiums, what they earn in overall inflation, that's the, the left-hand chart here. You can see what's, uh, what's coming out of workers' uh, pockets for health, health insurance is the stuff that's going like this, and what they're earning is going like this, all right? So no big surprise. Typically, uh, when there are increased uh, costs of fringe benefits, and health insurance is the biggest fringe benefit uh, for employers, uh, that gets shifted back onto workers dollar for dollar, either in, the term, in terms of... Uh, paying more for the health insurance, having wages grow less than the other otherwise would, having less generous benefits for health insurance. In some cases, employers drop health insurance entirely. All right, what about the, the federal budget? Uh, up until recently, health spending uh, was growing much more rapidly than GDP, which is just a, sim a simple way to illustrate that. The spending is grow growing more rapidly than our ability to pay for it. What do you pay for it out? You pay for it out of national, national income uh, per capita. Um, and and th that's, that's an issue. So here's a quote uh, from Peter Fisher, who was Undersecretary of the Treasury a few years ago. Think of the United States as a gigantic insurance company with a sideline business in <laughs> national defense. Now, again, sort of recent slowing in rate of growth helps, helps us out on this, but nonetheless, um, it, it's, it's a little extreme, but, but it gets the point across. Here's a graph from the Congressional Budget Office. You can see that, that federal health spending is going like this. Other stuff in these are going like this or growing more slowly. So health spending as part of the federal budget has been increasing steadily. And if these trends continue, then health spending will be a larger and larger and larger share of the US government budget. Uh, here's yet another way of, of illustrating it. Uh, if you look, uh, compare 2013 and then projections for future years, you can see the yellow boxes are, are federal spending. The projection is that uh, federal government spending on health care will have grown to uh, 1.76 trillion by 2023. It's about a little under a trillion now, so that's more, more than a doubling in a 10-year period. So that's, that's a big deal. All right, so who pays for this? Well, as I mentioned, on the private side, uh, workers pay for this. Uh, that that uh, it comes in the form of lower total compensation, whether it's uh, less pay or less less uh, fringe benefits, is not uh, is not really the first order issue. The other thing that can happen, of course, is as this happens, particularly if people lose health insurance, then there can be a shift onto the federal budget that the taxpayers have to cover. Uh, in terms of government health care programs, of course, current generations and future generations pay for this either directly through, uh, through taxes or increased taxes or indirectly because we cut spending on other things. It, it's, it's, uh, it's a fact that at the state level, when states' uh, funding of health care costs uh, go up, where their expenses go up, they cut funding for education. That, that's, that's exactly what happens uh, typically at states, but it happens in all kinds of other areas as well. Infrastructure, uh, defense, you, you pick it. Uh, and another point here is that, as, as you all undoubtedly know, employer-sponsored health insurance as a fringe benefit is excluded from income taxation, and, uh, and that is a, a cost as well. The um, Congressional Budget Office recently estimated that uh, the tax revenues foregone by this exclusion are almost $240 billion, which is about 1.5% of the entire economy. So that's a big number. If, uh, if we are collecting revenues from that, then there are things that could be done with that. There's another thing that's important here, and, and to an economist, it's, it's just as really, really even more important. It's a fact that, that employer-sponsored health insurance is excluded from taxation introduces a distortion. There is an incentive to favor the fringe benefit that's not taxed over income, and that leads to excessive provision of health insurance through the employment relationship, which 
leads to more generous insurance coverage, which ironically tends to do things like drive up health care costs, which drives up premiums, which drives up the cost of insurance, and works against the whole purpose. In addition, just because of the nature of the, of the income tax, this ends up being a, a, a quite a regressive uh, 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 policy to, to, for the U.S. to have. Now, uh, again, I'm not taking a position at all, but, but as, I, as you certainly know, uh, John McCain came out in, in, uh, in his uh, presidential campaign in favor of ending the exclusion. A version of that is part of the Affordable Care Act. The, the Cadillac tax has that aspect to it. Um, and to the extent that health care costs grow more rapidly than the overall economy, more and more health plans will fall under the, the Cadillac tax, which, which, uh, uh, which to an economist uh, looks, like, looks like a good thing, not, of course, because it imposes pain on taxpayers, but ultimately it, it's more efficient and, and potentially can allow for reduced taxes, say reduced income taxes, across the board, which can have all kinds of benefits for the economy as a whole, better incentives for, for individuals and for businesses. Okay, so all this is, well, uh, economics is the dismal science, so, uh, so this has been perhaps a, a little depressing, but there is, there is some good news in recent years, and uh, it's so-called health care cost sloth. The rate of growth, as I told you, has slowed substantially recently. Now, the... Um, a uh, $3 trillion question is whether this will continue or will cost growth speed up again. Uh, so I'm going to say the, the, the completely accurate, honest answer is we don't know. But I'll take it. I think we should be happy with, with this for the time being. But in my view, uh, we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, run up a flag and declare victory. Don't take the foot off the gas. Here it's very important, and let me go into a little bit more detail on this. Okay, this is actually something. This is just focusing on recent years, so you can see more clearly what's happening. You saw the long-term picture before, and you can see again we still have growth, but it's really quite remarkable how it's how it's slowed down. Although one other thing to note is you can see the rate of growth starting to slow before 2009, right? From 2007 to 2008, you see a drop as well. So uh, actually, the, the growth rate has been slowing down, uh, going all the way back to 2002. And actually, if you go back to 81, you've seen some slowing with some ups and downs, even since that time. But it's not steady, and the rate of growth of health spending has cycled for a long time. And let me show you a picture. So here, this goes all the way back to 1960, but it's important to take a long view here. And you can see lots of stuff like this, up, down, up, down, up, down. So if you go back, say, to the 70s, you see a downturn. You had wage and price controls by, by President Nixon at that time. You had something called, some of us will call the voluntary effort by hospitals under, under President Carter. You see some slowing in the mid-80s. You see some slowing. The prospective payment system uh, was brought in by Medicare, uh, was, I think was still HICFA. At, uh, at that time, not, not CMS. And then in the 90s, again, you see some, some really dramatic slowing. Managed care is usually given credit for that, but you see these things moving up, down, up, down. So the fact it's down now doesn't necessarily mean it's going to stay down. Again, we don't know what will happen, but, but certainly things have rebounded. So uh, we, we don't know exactly what's driving these cost cycles, and we don't know exactly what's driving what we're seeing, seeing now. But one thing we do see is when attempts are made to control costs and they seem to get some traction, not too surprisingly, there's, uh, there's a response to that. And there are attempts to undo those things either privately or through legislative efforts. It's been documented that following the quote-unquote managed care revolution in the, in the 1990s, a lot of state laws were passed, such as any willing provider laws, network adequacy laws, so on and so forth, that basically undid the gains in terms of uh, slowing cost growth of managed care and actually sent, uh, sent health care spending uh, back up again. Uh, there's a, a paper by somebody at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, uh, that I'm unfortunately forgetting the name now, that documents that and shows that the net effect of this legislation was to, to really dramatically 
increased costs. So there, there's going to be pushback whenever, whenever there's a, a slowdown. And, and the reason, of course, is that uh, somebody, one person's cost is somebody else's income. And that's a very simple reason. The, another reason is that uh, while these are costs that all of us bear for an individual who has insurance, usually the, the cost that they comes out of their own pocket or that they see is relatively small. And so they're getting more benefit than, than out-of-pocket costs, but of course society as a whole is bearing that whole cost. So attempts to control costs are often are not very popular, even if they are uh, good for society as a whole. Is this slowdown for real? I, I'm going to say uh, definitely maybe, uh, but that's not final. So uh, it, it's, it's relatively recent. Honestly, we don't have enough information to tell. I know there are, are folks out there who take strong positions and say, yes, it is. It's because of the ACA, or it's because of this, or others saying, no, it isn't because of this or that. I think we, we, we can't tell. Um, there are some things I, I think that can be suggestive. Everybody does agree that the recession has a lot to do with this. There, that's, that's, not, that's not controversial, and it's, uh, it's very sensible. One thing you saw a few minutes ago is that there are a bunch of other countries that are experiencing roughly the same thing, right? Germany, France, Japan, they have this pattern with, with the rate of growth healthcare spending leveling out over exactly this time period. They don't have the Affordable Care Act. They don't have the same population, but something's going on. Now, these countries were experiencing recession at the same time as the US. So it could be that, 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 that that's a piece of information. I'm not going to regard that as hard scientific evidence, but it is a piece of information suggesting that the worldwide recession could have a lot to do with it. Uh, we also know that over the recent time period, there have not been sort of major advances in medical technology, which tend to drive up costs. So there's been no new blockbuster drug for a number of years. Blockbuster drugs, of course, can be hugely beneficial, but they do tend to be expensive. And again, when something new comes out and it's really good, we want to use more of it. So that tends to, to drive up costs. We haven't seen that. In addition, there are a number of other things that we, we see. I don't think we see a, a huge shift in population health. It's true that there's increased consumer cost sharing. High deductible health plans have grown. But in my view, there's sort of not enough of them, and they haven't grown enough to be really uh, driving what we see, at least in any major part. Uh, possibly the Affordable Care Act, there are supply side reforms to the ACA or anticipation of them. Maybe. I mean, the ACA was passed in 2010. It's been around a few years now. Most of the supply side reforms either have only recently come online or still haven't really come online. I personally don't think it's realistic to expect that, that whatever impacts the ACA is going to have have, uh, have really taken hold yet, but there could be. There could be some, some impacts. Of course, it could be true that providers are doing things in advance of this. Uh, again, this isn't, this isn't hard evidence. I don't think uh, they, it's likely the ACA is the primary driver here. And that's, again, that's not take, saying the ACA won't do it or will do it. It's just saying I don't think there's been enough time. We can look also, there's been some slowing in healthcare employment. Uh, capital projects, if you look at that and they've slowed down a bit, that is some indication that you might expect some continued slowing because they, not surprisingly, usually go, on, go along with increased spending. So there is some evidence that this might, might continue, some evidence that it's not. Uh, again, my view, and I'm not saying I'm right, is that the economy has an awful lot to do with this, and I, I expect as the economy picks up, we're going to see some resumption in um, increase the rate of growth health spending. But, but I, I very well could be wrong. I, honestly, I think we just don't know. OK, um, uh, another reason to care. This is a nice, uh, a nice number. The, the Council of Economic Advisors in the White House estimated that uh, 1% decline in the rate of growth health spending can uh, lead to GDP 4% higher by uh, 2030. That's a lot. That's a big, big, big deal. This is, again, sort of saying if we took money out of health care and put it somewhere else, we'd get more bang for the buck. That's a very dramatic uh, impact. If family income would go out, we'd lower the budget deficit, we'd have lower unemployment. So, so this, this kind of stuff really matters. OK, uh, let me go to why. So what's, what's driving healthcare spending? Spending is simply price times quantity. 
Uh, and so if we're looking at increased spending, it has to be either prices going up or quantity going up or both. But let's talk about that, uh, that, uh, that a bit. Um, uh, on the private side, of, of course, uh, prices matter. They are determined in, in the market through negotiations between uh, health insurance companies and providers. On the public side, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, those are administered prices for the most part. So prices are not going to be a primary driver. Well, well, why do we care? Uh, one reason is if we see that a lot of increase in health spending is driven by increased prices, then first of all, it doesn't look like that's a lot of benefit going to consumers. That's probably more money going to the pockets of providers uh, without necessarily any increase in, in benefits to consumers. Now, I'll qualify that in a second. Uh, quantity, well, consumers may benefit, although, again, you can have excessive consumption. It's possible, of course, that if the quality of care in some broad sense is going up, prices could go up as a result of that, and people would be getting more value for that. So you do have to uh, take that into account. But let's, let's just take a, a quick look. This uh, comes from our friends at, at CMS, National Health Expenditure Team. The light blue bars, uh, they're breaking uh, per capita spending growth into what's driven by prices, age and sex, and residual use and intensity. See, so light blue bars are prices. So you can see prices have an awful lot to do with it. This is total health spending for the entire economy. So this includes uh, publicly funded spending like Medicare and Medicaid, where prices really can't be much of a driver. I mean, the administered prices do move around a bit, but, but not, not dramatically. Um, and you can see uh, age and sex factors um, have something to do with it, but that doesn't change much over time. In recent years, it looks like intensity has a larger part to do with it, but prices are still a big part of the picture. If we look at private prices, the yellow bars are, are, are price, blues, utilization, reds, intensity, except for professional services. It's mainly the prices, and this is, this is recent years. It's mainly prices that are big drivers of increases in, in, uh, in privately financed healthcare spending. So, so prices are a big part of the picture. What do we think might be driving health spending? One way to, to try and think about this is to act as if we're playing a game of Clue. I don't know if people are familiar with, uh, with the board game, or it's probably all electronic. Now, remember, but it was a Colonel Mustard in the library with a lamp stick, that kind of thing. And so you just kind of line up a list of suspects and run through and see whether it could be any one of those, right? This is like an Agatha Christie sort of approach. So aging population, right? We're, we're, getting, we're getting older. Um, at one point, I didn't have any gray in my beard. Now I do. Eventually, I figure that Dos Equis guy will retire and I'll have <laughs> enough that I can just slide right in there. I've been practicing how to... You know, the stay thirsty, my friends, uh, thing. So uh, there's that increased income. Income is higher. Uh, we do tend to spend more on health care with higher income. And a life care, that's something that's often discussed, right? At the end of life, a lot of resources get poured into care. So that's a possibility. Malpractice, right? that's often discussed. It's, it's a real uh, a hot button issue for physicians. In particular, uh, expenses associated with that. Market power of providers, hospitals, doctors, uh, et cetera. Uh, uh, we, we know that that's actually something that has been increasing over time. Incentives for patients, there are incentive issues because of cost. Uh, cost sharing or not, not a lot of cost sharing. And for providers because of the way they're paid. And last, I'm going to talk about uncertainty about what works in technology. So let's quickly run through these. So aging, the answer is nope, it's innocent. Uh, we do have an aging population that does lead to increased spending, but that's not the primary driver for the total increase in health spending that, that we're looking at here. What about income? Income total and per capita has increased over time, and that is a driver, but it doesn't tell the story. End of life care, if you look at, at that, uh, end-of-life care is expensive, but sort of any way you look at it, that hasn't really changed dramatically over time. So it can't be a driver in the growth in healthcare spending we've been looking at. Malpractice, again, um, it's, it's uh, not a huge part of healthcare spending, and the proportion of health spending that's due to malpractice, by any estimate, hasn't changed much 
over time. Like I said, it's a, it's a hot button issue for physicians. It's something that really gets their shorts in a knot, and I'm not saying I blame them, but it's not, it's not a big factor in terms of driving health spending. So, uh, so there may be policy reasons to be concerned about malpractice, but, dry, but, but overall healthcare spending is not uh, one of those reasons. All right, uh, market power is, uh, is a suspect. We know price increases are a major driver of spending for, uh, for those with private insurance. You already saw that. We also know there's been a huge amount of consolidation in the healthcare sector, over 1,200 mergers in the hospital industry from 1994 to the present, well over 300 in just the past three, four years. So a lot of consolidation. Um, doctors, uh, we also know that I think now about 20% of all physicians are employed by hospitals. We have ACOs forming, some of which are, are not necessarily real consolidation. Some of them are more like loose confederations, but some of them are. Um, and, and there are a lot of health systems that are so dominant in their markets that it's really hard for a health insurer to offer a plan without them in their network. And if that's the case, then the, the insurer doesn't have much negotiating power and that gives the health system a lot of ability to command higher, higher prices. Uh, we also know that in terms of enabling or facilitating entry and competition, there are lots and lots of barriers. So uh, medical schools, there have recently been some expansion med schools but for a long time, there was no change whatsoever. Long term, about half of all applicants to med school get in. Um, so it, it, it's not that it should be easy to get into med school, but, uh, but there are probably lots of people who would make good or maybe even great doctors who are not getting admitted. Uh, our policies with regard to foreign trained medical uh, professionals have varied over time. There are lots of state laws that restrict what non-physician providers like nurse practitioners, dental hygienists, uh, psychologists, uh, pharmacists can do. As you may know, there's a case that's at the Supreme Court involving dental hygienists in the state of North Carolina uh, that the FTC uh, took a stand on that I completely agree with, that this was uh, harming consumers uh, and, uh, and was anti-competitive. So, uh, so there are real issues with, with, uh, with there. We do know that consolidation in, in uh, healthcare markets leads to higher prices. Uh, we, we don't actually have, uh, have evidence whether consolidation is driving increased spending, but it does stand to reason that consolidation leads to higher prices. We had more consolidation over time, so that should be one of the drivers of prices going up. So in my view, um, this, is, this is a big, big issue. It's something that folks in the health policy arena are becoming more and more aware of and more sensitive to, but it's something that has been a bit under the radar for a lot of folks in, uh, in health policy. Okay, so here's some more stuff about market power. Uh, due to time, I'm not gonna go through all of this. You'll ha you have the slides. Certainly one last point is that there's also evidence about uh, competition and quality of care and that the quality of care that patients receive is actually lower where there's less competition. And, and this is relevant then not just for the privately insured, but for, for Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. So Medicare doesn't have to worry about uh, market power impacts on prices, but they do and they should worry about impacts on the quality of care that Medicare beneficiaries receive. Okay, so what's guilty as charged? Uh, incentive problems, yes, for consumers. Uh, now, insurance is important. People should not bear all the costs of care. They should be insured against extreme high expenses. But the tax exclusion of employer-sponsored insurance, as I said, leads to uh, too generous insurance, which drives higher spending and higher, higher premiums. Um, and if you don't, you're not paying a lot for it, it's not costing you much, you have an incentive to choose stuff that maybe in an aggregate sense of social level is cost more than it's worth, but for you, uh, is worth more than it costs out of your, out of your own pocket, and that draw, that creates an incentive to use newer, higher tech stuff. For providers, it's the same thing. Fee for service payment is often demonized. Uh, I just want to make the simple point that's not literally true. Um, it depends on the level of fees relative to cost. And think about uh, Medicaid is mostly managed care now, but back in the uh, back in the old days, it was fee for service. And it was hard to get uh, physicians in particular to see Medicaid patients. Why? Because Medicaid didn't pay very much. 
and it was a fee-for-service system. You didn't have an overuse problem with Medicaid. It was just the opposite. So it's a level of the fees. I'm not advocating necessarily for fee-for-service. It's a, it's a difficult system to administer uh, efficiently, but it, it's really high fees that, 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 are, that are the issue. In that case, there's an incentive to do more. When there's uncertainty about what works that we don't know, uh, people often want to play it safe and use what seems like, like uh, the most uh, effective thing. So sometimes that can result in effectively using an elephant gun to kill a gnat. Uh, and and I'll, I'll show you an example of, of that in, in just a minute. And technology has, has an awful lot to do with this. Now, obviously, all these things are intertwined. They're not, not completely independent. But uh, very few technological advances in medical care are cost-saving. They're mostly cost-increasing, in part because they improve value, and so we tend to use more of them. Uh, so that's, that's fine, but again, we have these incentives for both providers and patients that sort of make this a perfect storm where everybody privately has an incentive to use this stuff that leads to more of it being, being supplied, and we use more of it, and that tends to drive up health spending. Uh, sometimes people talk about something called the technological imperative, like if it's, if it's out, build it, and they will come, right? So when MRIs came out, everybody wanted those, even though it wasn't necessarily clear. They're always appropriate to the best thing. Um, so uh, uh, we don't like, people don't like the idea of, of not using whatever the newest high-tech thing is. So uh, there is probably some element of truth to this. And here's a little, we'll see if this video clip will work. Uh, this is, anybody familiar with... Sorry? Will it, will it work? Sound. What about the sound? Oh, sorry. I should have told you. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, if you, I don't know if you folks are familiar with the mockumentary, This is Spinal Tap. Uh, if you're not, you, you should make yourselves familiar. And this is an example of uh, the technological imperative. Is it working? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if the volume's up there. That's the only All right. thing. <laughs> should we just try it and see what yeah, happens? Yeah, let's give it a try. All right. Okay, let's let's try. So this is a quick or not. <laughs> oh, I'm not working. All right, it's not working. Well, anyhow, I strongly <laughs> So th this is a this is a scene in which uh, the guitarist in the group who um, has more musical talent um, than IQ, shall we say? <laughs> Uh, is showing the maker of the documentary an amp. Try it now. All right, we'll see if it works. I don't think it's going to. It is a great scene, but I don't think I don't think it's going to work. My my apologies. And he's got an amp, and rather the dial for volume, rather than stopping at ten, goes to eleven. And the documentary maker says, "Well, what difference does it make? What if you just made ten louder?" And the guy stands there. For and is thinking, you can sort of see the wheels trying to assist, but it goes to 11. <laughs> and so that's often what people say is happening in medical care, that we have something new, it's supposedly high tech, better, and we don't necessarily think too hard about that. So here's, a, here's an example. Uh, I don't know if you folks have heard about proton beam therapy. Uh, my economist colleague at Harvard, Amitabh Chandra, is fond of calling this the death star of medical <laughs> technology. So uh, you can see on the left, this is, uh, the right is a patient going into the machine. The left is, I don't know if you can see the little red stick figure, and this gigantic thing, basically the whole facility is the size of a football field. Um, it's a treatment for prostate cancer, so obviously uh, for, for men. It uh, costs about $120 million to build. We have no idea if this works. But it's really cool. It's, it's like a rocket ship, so so we should use it, shouldn't we? Well, Medicare pays uh, uh, providers uh, 1400 bucks a treatment. It costs about $28,000 to put somebody through the recommended course of treatments. Um, it may cost a lot of money, but at least we really don't know if it, if it works or not. Um, if you th one way to think about it is if we, if we took that $28,000, let's suppose that a health insurance policy costs 12000 Dollars, right? We could provide health insurance for, for two for that. If that's, that's a pretty generous health insurance policy, possibly more. Or that money could go towards repairing all the crumbling bridges in the United States. I live in Pennsylvania, 
which has lots of bridges, and most of them are going to fall down in the relatively near future. That's obviously not good for, uh, for individuals, but it's not good for business either, because most, co most uh, uh, stuff is transported on trucks, on roads, and we need bridges in order to literally support the economy. In general, um, there's a study that was done uh, a couple of years ago by folks who published in the British Medical Journal that claims that about half of medical treatments out there have unproven effectiveness. About half. We don't, I don't know if we know which half. I hope we do. But, uh, but that, that's, that's shocking. Even if they're wrong, even if it's a quarter, that's a huge amount. Um, there are other examples, things like people being given antibiotics for viruses, annual physicals, uh, PSA tests, stuff that they're low tech, but they just don't do much of anything. And so it's just wasted money going to that. And I said, incentives that both consumers and providers have, technological advances, all come together in this way to really drive this, uh, the, the tech, uh, technolo technological innovation and adoption and healthcare cost growth. Okay, so what do we do about it? I'm, this, is, uh, this is the end. Uh, even though we've had a slowing in the rate of growth of healthcare costs, and that's tremendously helpful, I would say don't, let's not assume it will last, and certainly don't let up on the pressure. It, it, the, what's, what's been happening in the healthcare sector in the U.S. over a long period of time is excessive growth. It's really doing, doing harm to, to, to the country. Not that there's no value, I want to be clear to that, but we've really gone beyond the point where we, we need to be. And uh, I think it's important to realize that uh, two things. One, uh, this is not a sector of the economy or an industry that uh, we're going to get to perfection, right? You, you, if you took economics in college, remember perfectly competitive markets. These live on the pages of economics textbooks. There are a few things like maybe milk or retail gasoline that look a lot like that. We're not going to make this market look like that. That's not realistic, and, and shooting for that is probably counterproductive. It doesn't mean we shouldn't work at it, but let's have, let's have some realistic goals in mind. Um, the other thing is that uh, this, is a, this is a very complex system, and there's no single thing that we uh, can or should do that's likely to, uh, to address the problem. And we don't necessarily want to cut how much we're spending, but we want, do want to slow the, the rate of growth. And just to put a little nuance on that, we have to think about private and public sector issues somewhat differently. And, a, and an obvious point of departure between the two has to do with prices, right? Market power on the part of providers uh, drives up prices in the private sector. That's, that's an issue, like I said. That's not a direct issue on the public side, although quality is. Uh, so technology is is a big is a big driver, and uh, it, it's going. It, this is not not an easy problem. We have to keep chipping away at it, and it's going to take a lot of different things to to address this. There's no one silver or or magic magic bullet. So anyhow, um, I've I have talked long enough. I hope I gave you a picture at least sort of at a fairly high level of, of what, what's going on and, and what some of the issues are and hopefully some facts that, that you'll find useful. And, and I'll stop talking and if, if, okay. uh, if we want to do some. I'm, I'm a professor. I'm sorry. <laughs>